Bam! It is. Awesome. Alright guys, let me know in the Discord chat if you can hear me. You should be hearing me through YouTube. Alright guys, let me know in the Discord chat if you can hear me. You should be hearing me through YouTube. Alright guys, let me know in the Discord chat if you can hear me. You should be hearing me through YouTube. Alright guys, let me know in the Discord chat if you can hear me. You should be hearing me through YouTube. Alright guys, let me know in the Discord chat if you can hear me. You should be hearing me through YouTube. All right, guys, let me know in the Discord chat if you can hear me. You should be hearing me through YouTube. All right. Sorry, that feedback with my end. I had I had YouTube open, so it was sorry. All right, guys, so the, way, the basic way this works is uh, I, I basically talk at you through YouTube and then you talk back at me through Discord, all right? So you, you can use either voice chat or you can use type chat. I don't care which one you want to use. Just remember that if you use voice chat, you're going to be in the video. Just be aware of that. And also make sure that you guys have your push to talk set. I, it looks like you guys do. All right, sounds good. Yeah, I like using Discord for this. The, the, the ping is pretty obvious when it pings you when people are asking questions. Where uh, like YouTube doesn't make much sound, neither does uh, Zoom when you're using that. All right, um, so, uh, be, so the plan for today's discussion was I did want to go over the uh, distillations experiment that you're supposed to be doing this week. And then I also wanted to go over SN1, SN2. Let me turn the face cam on. Hello. You guys should be seeing me now. Looks like it's live to me. <laughs> Got my OCHEM Survivor shirt on. Help, I'm dying. <laughs> yeah, help, I'm dying. I think I wore this before, probably. I usually wear this teach while teaching OCHEM. On lab days, right? Y'all bring your lab goggles today? It's supposed to be lab day. Wait, wait, wait. All right. So I want to talk about lab today. I'm, I'm totally wearing my lab goggles today <laughs> during this. <laughs> All right. Uh, unfortunately, no, because the, the explosion would be in my house. So I don't want to blow anything up today. <laughs> Preferably uh, no explosions today. No chemistry. Wait, my, my wife is yelling right now. No chemistry in the house. Like, I guess that means I'm not cooking tonight then, right? Cooking is chemistry. Let me wipe these off real quick. <laughs> yeah, th there's actually quite a few uh, YouTubers out there. Like, there's one, there's a couple, like, it's like uh, Red Nile and Cody's Lab. Uh, those guys do, like, backyard and garage chemistry, and it's a lot of really cool stuff. That And there's stuff that I would be afraid to do even in the lab. That they're doing in their backyard, so yeah, I'll I'll, I'll find their channel and link them in the Discord later on. But yeah, it's, it's Nile Red and Cody's Lab. I like I like watching their stuff. They do some pretty cool stuff. All right, so uh, I did want to go ahead and uh, talk about the lab today. So let me go ahead and uh, switch over. Where are we? Oops, browser. Hang on. I had it open already. There we go. All right. So I did post this the other day, guys, uh, this video here. Um, I, I apologize if, uh, so the video I found, it, it sounds like the person is uh, Chinese. There are Chinese subtitles in there. And uh, he has a pretty, he has an accent, but I think he's perfectly fine. Um, I, it was the only, the, I, I, found, I thought it was the best video on YouTube that I could find that covered both simple and fractional distillations. Uh, so the way we would typically do this lab, um, you can actually read this in the, you should have read this in the handout. Uh, so basically what you would do is you would do a simple distillation first, and then you would basically, with, it had acetone with food coloring and water in it. You would collect the acetone from the distillation, 
and then you would basically uh, mix it all back together again and then do a fraction distillation on the same liquid. And then you, uh, what ends up happening is you see a different uh, rate at which the uh, acetone comes out. So with that in mind, uh, does anybody uh, happen to know offhand which method is will yield uh, more pure acetone, a simple or fractional distillation? Did anybody read the lab yet? Or watch the video? Yeah, it works out that fractional distillation is actually the better method for purification. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull up that lab handout. It's, it's in modules, let me go to modules. Still doing lab three. Yeah, it's fine if, if, if yeah, because we technically lab three is due this week, right? So we're, we're, we're essentially, yeah, we were, I'm, I'm trying to keep the lab set up kind of the same what we would, we would be doing in person. So you typically work a week ahead in lab. Like we do the lab, turn it in next week. I'm, I'm just trying to maintain that kind of schedule for trying to make it feel like we're still in a regular semester and not in a crazy pandemic shutdown. <laughs> All right, so uh, hold this up. Uh, if you guys have the, remember if you have the lab manual, this is literally the same thing from the lab manual. I just gave you a digital copy because of COVID. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so here, let me move my, move my face over here. There we go, and make it a little smaller. All right, so uh, here is your basic setup for a fractional simple distillation right here. Uh, this is a pretty uh, common procedure done in organic chemistry. So essentially what we have here is uh, we have a round bottom flask, a uh, distillation head right here. You, uh, I typically call it the Y adapter because it looks like an upside down Y almost. And then we have the uh, thermometer adapter and Typically people will ask questions about the placement of the thermometer. I think there actually is a question about the placement of the thermometer in the post lab for this lab. Uh, does anybody by chance know, like, uh, does, does it matter where the bulb is at? Or like, what is the significance of where the bulb is at uh, in a distillation process? To kind of help out, it, it specifically should be exactly where it's showing it here. Uh, but there's a reason why, see if you guys know what it, what it is. What is the reason? Um, so in short, the main reason why is because uh, you, hang on, did I close Discord? Hang on. That's weird. Sorry, I thought I closed Discord. Uh, anyway, so the, the main reason why the thermometer bulb needs to be here <laughs> yeah, the stream will go onward. <laughs> All right, so the, the main reason why the bulb is here is to make sure that you have a good measurement of when the vapor and liquid phase are in equilibrium. So uh, let me just back here a little bit because since you guys didn't do the reading yet, maybe, I want to talk a little bit about this graph here and how distillations even work for purifications. Uh, so here, uh, you can imagine here we have a 50-50 mixture of two liquids. Uh, so once again, the answer to that question was about the thermometer placement uh, was to make sure that you have a good point to measure for when the liquid and gas phase are in equilibrium. And it happens right at that joint is when they're in equilibrium. All right, so uh, here we have the, the, the plot of liquid and vapor of this mixture. Uh, we have temperature on the y-axis and then on the x-axis, this is mole fraction. If you guys remember from your freshman chemistry, you could think of it kind of like percentage, percent composition by moles. Uh, so here we have uh, the initial mixture. So here I'm at point P. Uh, what ends up happening when you uh, heat this thing up, it turns out that it becomes enriched towards A. Like the mole fraction becomes more enriched towards A. And the main reason why is because you know, looking at the boiling points here of the pure, pure liquids, a has a much more, uh, much lower boiling point. So when you boil this, the vapor should have a tendency to have more of A in it than B because it's more volatile. 
So hopefully that's making sense to you guys. And then it turns out when you condense that vapor, it falls back down to the vape liquid state and it's more enriched as a result in A. I could do that, but I like to do live lecturing, not asynchronous. Oh, sorry, there's also the Zoom thing. Uh, yeah, so I am not gonna be uh, uploading just straight up Zoom lectures either because my department chair didn't like it. So here we are. So I guess your MLS professor is not in my department. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> it, wor it works out where uh, the more times that this liquid vapor uh, uh, fa cycle can happen, the more enriched it becomes in A. Uh, so it works out that when you have the fractionating column versus the simple column, you have more surface area inside the fractionating column than you would in a simple column. So you, uh, you end up getting uh, more of these uh, cycles happening, therefore becoming uh, more pure A is coming out as a result. So let's go ahead and take a look down here. So this is the glassware setup. Uh, here there is a double jacketed condenser, which is a pretty unique to organic chemistry here. So uh, the way these work is it's essentially uh, two hollow tubes. The outer one's cut enclosed and you basically would hook up a water hose right here and then you have it go out the top here. Uh, it's pretty crucial that you make sure you put water in at the correct joint because uh, if you have water coming in the top joint, what ends up, what ends up happening is that the water just kind of falls down due to gravity and then you end up with a big air bubble inside of this uh, condensing column. If you have it coming in this way, water has to push against gravity, and then you end up with a result where it basically fills the whole thing with water. So this thing becomes more filled with water, it, it is more efficiently keeping it cooler uh, if water comes in the lower joint here. And people have done other setups where they put uh, other salt things running through it. Like I had a lab where we had like super cold uh, ethylene glycol running through these condensing columns, and they were coiled, and that kind of stuff. They, they serve the same kind of purpose. They're essentially cooling down the vapor as, it, as any vapor comes in this tube, it'll condense and then drip down here. Right, let me go down to the uh, picture of the fractionating column. So here's your fractionating column. So if you, if you actually com compare the two uh, different drawings here, uh, the way it is, um, typically what I would tell students to do in lab is that they have their simple distillation and I just tell them to pull this top part off plug in the condenser and then snap it back together. And then typically while you're waiting for part A to happen, uh, you, I, I tell students to make this column. Uh, the way we, we would make this column is we would basically put a piece, we would take the, a regular condenser just like this one. These are exactly the same kind of condenser. But instead we would pack it with some glass wool and then some glass beads. And what that does, it dra drastically increases the surface area that the vapor has to pass through before it condenses. So what ends up happening is pretty much pure A comes over, then pure B comes over. Does that make sense, guys? The differences between simple and fractional? So uh, the question here is discussing about YouTube and all that stuff. So one, one of the reasons why I am using YouTube over using Big Blue Button and that kind of stuff is because I want this to be like permanent content that I'm generating. I see, I see that we're doing all this stuff here and I am, gen uh, I am technically generating content that I could be using for later courses that I could pick and pull from. Literally how I built this course, uh, doing this transition to online. So I, I, and I feel that all like educational material should be free to everybody. So I feel that there, if there is some random person in Indonesia who wants to learn organic chemistry, they should be able to watch my videos and do so if they want to. So I feel that educational should be free to everybody, but yeah, I'm not the one in charge. So here we are. So I figure YouTube is the easiest platform to kind of just spread my knowledge to everybody in the world. And I don't want it behind a paywall or any kind of locked wall that people have to pass through. Yes, I personally feel that education should be free because it is a benefit for our society for people to be educated. But I'm getting into a whole other discussion here about this. So <laughs> I, I personally feel that way. But the thing is, it's very problematic. The society as a whole has to make it happen. And yeah, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> yeah, we could be doing a lot better. As, as a society, we can be doing a lot better with the way that we uh, do education and the way it's monetized. 
All right, um, you guys are gonna be generating a graph, so I did provide some data for you to work with. Um, let me pull it up. So here's the actual assignment. It's in the actual assignment. And then the uh, second page is right here. And uh, basically what I have here is uh, you would have been generating this data in your lab notebook. So essentially what it is, it's milliliters of distillate collected. And then uh, you basically would do the distillation twice and then for each run you would go ahead and collect. So I want to point out here that notice what's happening with the numbers here. So uh, I'll, I'll do a visual version too on the paper, but I just want to kind of uh, numerically look at this. So if you look at the simple distillation, you may notice that there's a gradual climb from roughly 68 degrees C to uh, about 97, 96 range. It's a gradual increase. Where if you look at the fractional distillation, it's quite a bit different. So notice for the fractional distillation, it holds constant roughly like within one or two degrees and then all of a sudden it jumps. So like all of a sudden it jumps here, it looks like at about 14 to 15 range, uh, it jumps. So the reason why it's doing that jump is that you have, uh, this, so this is for water and acetone. You have pure acetone coming through and then all of a sudden all the acetone is gone and then it jumps to the boiling point of water. Uh, what you would have physically seen in the lab is that when you got to about this 14 mil point, uh, it appears that distillation stopped. And students always ask me, oh, hey, is it done? Like there's still liquid down there. And I tell them, no, you need to wait because now the water is going to come going. But you have to heat it, have to push through up to the boiling point of water. So once again, for simple distillation, you're not getting the nice, clean, like the super good separation you're getting with fractional. So it gradually increases up to the boiling point of water, where with the fractional distillation, the acetone comes out first, holds roughly constant, all of a sudden jump, and then, yeah, if it's lagging, just catch it later, guys. I know lagging is an issue with live streams in general. It'll, and it also depends on your internet connection and my internet connection and all the, all the above, so. All right, uh, so quickly, I wanna go ahead and do a uh, visual of what I just talked about, uh, so you guys are understanding this. Present your camera, there we go. Oops, my camera's crooked. Hang on, let me, one sec. Yeah, guys, so I, I wanna, so uh, this came up last semester too, so if, if one of your kids in your house is like playing Fortnite or something, or they're watching YouTube videos, that does affect your internet connection drastically. So uh, if, you're, if you are lagging in the stream and your, your, your children are playing video games, tell them to stop or play offline. Or uh, streaming in particular is really bad. Yeah, stream, streaming vi video content can really bog your internet down if you don't have a good connection. Yeah, I personally stepped up to the uh, like the one of the, next to the top package that our provider offers, and I don't. I still think I lag a little bit when when we're all doing our work. All right, so uh, so you guys are going to generate a graph uh, from that data. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an approximate of what it should look like. So on the x-axis, you want ml of distillates. And then over here on the y-axis, you want degree C. And then what you're going to see for a simple distillation, it's going to do a, it's going to start here, then kind of gradually climb like that, like so. So that'll be for a simple. And then what's going to happen with the fractional distillation is it typically starts at just a little bit lower, and then it holds kind of fairly constant, and then boop, jump and then they kind of equal out up there at the top, like that. And so this one is fractional, like so. So that is roughly what your graph is gonna look like this week. If you wanna do it, uh, so I want the two graphs in the same graph space. So basically overlay them and then you may, need to make sure that you include a legend and make the graph look a little bit different so you can tell which graph is for which one. And that's the, uh, if you look at the lab handout itself, I did have graph paper in there that you could just do it by hand. I don't really care which way you guys do it. I have a soft spot for uh, graphs by hand, but I'm old school, so 
I like doing graphs by hand. All right, uh, so that's it. For, uh, that's, that's pretty much it for the lab. Did you guys have any questions about the lab? Any question about lab? No questions at the moment. Okay. All right. So I guess the one cool part about teaching online is lab shoes. <laughs> You don't want to wear shoes and laugh. <laughs> All right, guys, so uh, I want to go ahead and switch gears. I'm going to take my goggles off now. <laughs> take my goggles off now. And I, I want to go ahead and give you guys a general overview of SN1, SN2 today. And then I'm thinking, oh, there's the boy. <laughs> Hi, Tristan. Hang on, let me, you guys got to see the thing. Let me switch to the full screen. Yep, bare feet and in pajamas. Perfect lab attire. <laughs> All right, buddy. I gotta teach. <laughs> Did you hear that? These are my glasses. <laughs> All right, guys. So let's go ahead and do um, some SN1, SN2 stuff. Um, hopefully, you guys got a chance to kind of get an idea. All right, so S, oops, hang on. I need to fix the lead in that one. This one should be working. All right, so I'm gonna do some stuff written by hand, but I, I did wanna just uh, do the quick overview of the mechanisms, and then I wanna kinda talk a little bit of detail with a specific example. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch uh, over to the browser before we start doing the stuff on paper. So, where is it? Here. Yeah, I'm missing all the Discord chat. <laughs> mine, mine, mine. Okay. All right, uh, you guys should have this handout on Canvas. Uh, it's the substitution and elimination comparisons. All right, so uh, what, what, what basically is happening here, so I'm taking a look at the uh, SN2 side. I typically, when I typically, when I teach this stuff, I typically teach SN1 Sorry, SN2, then SN1, and then we go over both these together the, the following week, which is what we're doing here, sort of. So it works out. We are here with the SN2. Uh, we have a nucleophile. Remember, we, we talked about that word last week, nucleophile, attacking a carbon. And then because carbon already has four bonds to it, it something has to give. So what that is is whatever thing is the weakest base out of all the groups attached, uh, will be your leaving group. So once again here, uh, just be clear that whatever uh, nucleophile attacks the carbon, if there is a weak base attached to the carbon, that'll be your leaving group. It works out for the SN2 if this all happens all at once. So that's the rate determining step. And we'll talk about rate laws here on paper with a specific example. All right, uh, the next uh, type here is the SN1. If you actually compare the mechanisms like side by side, at a net result is they are very, very similar in the, what, what the end game is. There are some significant differences though, but overall, if you look, there's basically two arrow pushes for the SN1 mechanism, just like there was with SN2. The most notable difference is that it's stepwise versus being concerted. So this mechanism is concerted, meaning all at once. This mechanism is stepwise. All right, so any questions so far? So one, que one mechanism is concerted, one of them is stepwise. The net result is a substitution of the nucleophile uh, or the leaving group for the nucleophile at the end. All right, so uh, because of the fact that uh, SN1 uh, has more than one step, 
it works out that uh, whichever step is, is the slow step is the one that governs the reaction mechanism uh, speed, like how fast the reaction can go. Uh, if you recall from your uh, general chemistry class about uh, multi-step reactions and reaction kinetics, uh, what ends up happening essentially is that you can imagine that you're trying to say like get off the freeway and it's a one lane exit off the freeway. And suppose that, uh, suppose you're coming up behind somebody and you want to go 75 miles per hour, but the car in front of you is going 30 miles an hour. How fast are you going to be going off to get off the freeway? <laughs> you're going to be going as, as slow as that slow car is basically because uh, because you're on a one lane road you're kind of stuck behind that and the same kind of thing happens in chemistry where you have this slow step kind of hanging up the whole process like come on I, I, would, I would imagine the fast reactions kind of honking their horns telling this person to hurry up yeah uh, some teachers talk about rate determining step in, in 122 I know I do, but the main reason why I do is because I'm an organic chem instructor. I know it comes up again, but that all depends on the teacher. Your teacher may have gone over multi-step reactions during kinetics. Uh, but it, once again, it works out where the actual rate law of your reaction is determined by whatever that slow car was doing. So basically you have the broken down beater. That's your rate determining step. That is your rate law. <laughs> it's, it's based off of what that car is doing. So. With that in mind, I want to do some specific examples, and then I'm going to talk the details, and the details are actually all here listed out. I didn't want to just read through the handout with you guys. I kind of wanted to talk through a problem, but I'm going to be basically going through this handout, but just more visually. So yeah, so have this handout available. I'm going to be referencing to it. Oops, sorry, yeah, the, this handout. All right, so I wanna go ahead and just go ahead and just do a problem. And so the ones in, in that are generic examples. I wanna do a specific example. So here, it should be pretty obvious uh, where your uh, nucleophile is going to attack. But uh, first things first, I wanna make sure that you guys are uh, having the same lingo with me. So it works out the main organic component is referred to as a substrate. So it's technically, yes, technically is a reactant, but it's more specifically the substrate. And I like to think of the substrate as the thing that we actually care about. <laughs> uh, typically, uh, the other compounds, so like the non-organic part, so oftentimes we'll be reacting with things that are inorganic. These types of compounds, the things you put in your arrow, Yes, it's also a reactant, but more specifically, we refer to it as a reagent. So once again, uh, the main organic piece is referred to as a substrate. And then whatever like chemical we're going to be adding to it to, to get it to react, that's the reagent. So looking at this carbon-bromine bond, we can clearly find the electrophilic site. That's going to be this carbon right here that's delta positive. This is delta minus. So then, should I use... Oh, we're doing pink arrows today. I got a pink pen. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So you get the backside attack. So uh, uh, here, I want to be clear that you guys are understanding this is a backside attack. on the carbon bromine bond. And we get OH like that. So if I am concerned with mass balance, what else should I have here? There's one more piece of the puzzle here. What is my other product? Anybody? for mass balance purposes. Br minus, and what else? Uh, water is not a product. 
Wa uh, so it can't be water uh, because of the fact that uh, hydroxide is now attached to the carbon. So there's no water product here. You will often see water products when you either do a dehydration reaction or if you do an acid base. Yep, that's right. Uh, sodium bromide is your side product here. Um, I am not particular about saying, uh, like you pointing out spectator ions. Uh, I do want to mention that sodium ions in organic chemistry, that is their, the most common role of sodium ions in organic chemistry is spectator. So I want so I, so one thing uh, that some students are usually concerned about with with test questions is like if I ask you to predict the product. So uh, if I ask a question that's asking about predicting products, I am specifically looking for what became of the substrate. So, the, so this this substrate became this. You could put that if you wanted to, but I would not be looking for that. If if I said write the complete balanced reaction, now I'm looking for all of it. You guys understand the difference here? So if I say predict the product, I'm only looking for what the substrate became. If I say write the complete balanced reaction, I want it all. And I typically do one example on the exam and quiz where I want it all. I will tend to focus on what the product became because we're typically not worried all too much about what this is. If it's ionic, we know how to get rid of it. And that's basically what it is. Yeah, there's no water at all in this reaction, guys. Uh, the only water there would be would be uh, very likely this would be in a water solution, but water is not part of this reaction. Water would likely be a solvent if it were there at all. Yeah. Yeah, so any, like, the, I think what might be throwing people off here is the hydroxide here. Uh, this hydroxide is your nucleophile. It is now attached to the substrate. All right, so uh, running out of colors here. What color should you use for the, I have an orange? I have an orange. All right, so uh, it works out where uh, in this reaction, our, your substrate is your electrophile. Substrates are electrophiles and your reagents are the nucleophiles. All right, so the reason why we're doing it this way, because uh, typically the arrow is gonna come from the reagent towards your substrate. So I was reading chat there for a second. All right. So uh, taking a look here, uh, we only have we have a one-step reaction here. So this is the rate determining step. It's the slow step. The slow step. And as a result, uh, what happens here is the rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of everything involved in this step of the reaction. So this step involves both the substrate and the reagent. So we're going to say that it's this and then NaOH. So I, I, I also want to make it, make it clear for you guys, if I'm asking you for a rate law, the rate law needs to be specific for the reaction. A common mistake students make is they give me the generic rate law from the handout. So the handout states, I believe, substrate and nucle... Yeah, so see how, how the rate law is here? Nucleophile and substrate, that's the generic rate law. If I put it on a test and I give you a reaction, I want a specific rate law. So the way I'm showing it here is a specific rate law. All right. So uh, where the name comes from, so this is the SN2. So this is your S, and it's actually sub N2. Like that's typically how it's written. So colorful. <laughs> yeah, col uh, OCHEM gets very colorful from here on out. <laughs> this is kind of how it's going to go for the rest of the semester, very colorful. I recommend that you guys also do that. Like I have this big pile of colored pens I, I used to use colored pencils, but I got sick of having to sharpen them while I was teaching. <clears throat> All right, so uh, where this name comes from, it is substitution, because that's what's happening. We're trading one group for another, substitution. 
it's nucleophilic. Your reagent was nucleophilic. That's why the end goes there. So typically, the, uh, these are based off of what, uh, what your reagent is, oftentimes, at least with this stuff. And then the two here uh, means the reaction order. So this reaction is second order. So that's where the two comes from. And it works out for all these reactions, the exponents are one. So don't worry about the exponents here. We're just worrying about what, whether we have the substrate and nucleophile or just the substrate is the main difference here. All right, I think I want to do uh, one of the questions. Uh, no, sorry, we need to do SN1 first, then I'll do that question. Uh, but before that, are there any questions about this here? I need to mention one more thing to you before we move on. So uh, in the actual uh, long form video where I'm doing the full on lecture here, I do draw transition states and all that. You need to look through that stuff, guys. Um, we're not going to do it all here because I want to make sure we get, get the quick like whole overview of all these, but make sure you get those details from my other videos. I, and you know, one's of me talking about it, one's of the other guys talking about it, whoever, just make sure you get that content. But there is a transition state theory here, a uh, discussion you need to make sure you go through to help further understand how this reaction works. So with that in mind, um, do we have any stereochemistry concerns with SN2? Did anybody by chance happen to catch up on that? Is stereochemistry a factor in SN2 reactions? You know the answer to me? Yes, otherwise I wouldn't have brought it up. But So it works out where for SN2, your stereochem inverts, and for SN1, it racemizes. So stereochem inverts. This is a non-issue for this particular example because of the fact that uh, it's not chiral. You know what? We're going to do an example where it is chiral just to make sure you're understanding what happens here. So let's go ahead and make this one secondary. Let's do that. Let's go ahead and say our leaving group is a, let's say CL. That'll be fine. Uh, like so. And then let's say it's NASH is our nucleophile. So here we're going to, oh, we're doing pink arrows today. I forgot. We got the pink arrows today. So we have the backside attack like that. I also do want to make sure that you guys are understanding that I am a stickler about certain things. And I am actually very particular about the direction of the arrow here. It must be a proper backside attack. So what I mean by that, if you have the arrow coming in from this direction, that's a frontward attack, I mark off a point for that. It must be a backside attack. And then, so after the backside attack, we have the bond breaking, like that. And because of that, uh, the stereochemistry inverts. So what you can do in your product here is just change the wedge to a dash, and then whatever your nucleophile is, and then chlorine basically swaps out for SH here. So we're gonna, instead of having NaSH, we're gonna have NaCl. Excuse me, sodium ion is a spectator. So here it went from being S to R. It's from S. It's from one of the lone pairs on S. So the question was, uh, where is the arrow coming from? I, I, in this short version here, I'm just showing it from the atom, but it's from the lone pairs on the heteroatom. That's the case for this one too. Yeah, it should be lone pairs on oxygen are the ones doing the attack. It's electron rich, it's nucleophilic. Uh, so one thing you can do, you can uh, remember also that uh, nucleophiles, nucleophilicity and basicity have a lot of overlap. So uh, if you see something that you would think would be a base from like your last chapter, chances are it is, and it's going to be a nucleophile also. So the, so the main thing between, so next week we're going to go into the other set of the reaction, which is elimination. You're going to see the main difference between substitution and elimination is whether or not the, the reagent is acting as a base or a nucleophile. So here in the substitutions, the reagents are always going to be nucleophiles. For the eliminations, they're all going to be bases doing acid-base reactions with the organic compound. 
but yeah, that's next week. I don't want to. I don't even want to start talking about how it's different from a regular acid base. So, <clears throat> all right. Yep, lone pairs. Awesome. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the other mechanism. Uh, the other mechanism is the SN1. So uh, I want to do a specific example here. I think we'll do two specific examples here. So, uh, oops, I forgot to mention something first before we move on. Something else I forgot to mention about SN2. Uh, so the reason why uh, we mentioned this backside attack is because it also has a uh, huge impact on the reactivity of the substrate towards this mechanism. Uh, so for example, the, the easier it is for the nucleophile to get in here, the faster the substrate will react towards this type of mechanism. So remember that these compounds can go multiple pathways through their, through their chemistry, and some will have a tendency to go one pathway over the other for a substitution mechanism. This pathway is favored if we have less bulkiness here. So uh, these reactions happen faster if we have methyl, primary, that kind of thing here. And I believe we covered methyl and primary and stuff last week or week before. Yeah, so here the steric effects, it works out because of the backside attack, bulky groups have an effect on the reactivity of the substrate. So it works on methyl is the fastest, like methyl bromide, for example, uh, followed by primary, secondary, and tertiary is pretty much no SN2, no SN2s. If it's tertiary, it's going SN1, which we'll talk about here in a second. All right, so, all right, let's take a look. Switch over to the document camera. All right, so uh, next we have the uh, SN1. Take a look. So the SN1, the, it's characterized by having a two-step mechanism and the intermediate is very important. So it's, it's basically, uh, we have a carbocation intermediate. It is a carbon with a plus charge on it. So yes, we can have carbons without an octet. They end up being cations as a result if they're missing electrons. So I want to go ahead and do an SN1, some generic one. And let's just go ahead and say something like this. Actually, I want to make this one a chiral center. So let's go ahead and say it's a benzene. There, pH for phenyl for benzene. And let's go ahead and say our leaving group is chlorine this time. Actually, let me do iodine instead, iodine. We did chlorine already, and I wanna, I wanna keep mixing them up, so iodine's fine. And I'm filling in lone pairs here. All right, so it works out with the SN1. Uh, the rate determining step is the first step. Or in this example, it's gonna be the first step, but it's whenever the leaving group leaving is the rate determining step. And SN1s are characterized by the leaving group kind of just leaving on its own. It doesn't need the, the coaxing of the nucleophile like the other one. So because of that, uh, oftentimes when these leaving groups leave on their own, they are often weak bases too. So drawing the result. That. We now have a carbocation intermediate. So this is our RDS. carbocation intermediate. Like that. And then the other thing that happens after this forms is whatever your nucleophile is then comes in and, and attacks. Oftentimes with SN1, the nucleophile is often weak. So uh, just to make sure we're all understanding here, this is the nucleophile. This is the electrophile, and for SN1, it's often weak. Often weak for SN1. And pink arrows today, so nucleophile attacks. So uh, uh, typically when you're using water as a nucleophile, oftentimes you end up with a water as your, or sorry, an alcohol as your product. 
Um, you just need to make sure that you're uh, remembering a step. So recall that water has two H's on it. So we're, we still have two H's over here on this. Like that. All right. Like so. All right, so now we have a little uh, tricky question here. So the reaction is not done at this point. So typically the reaction will stop at a alcohol. If you recall from the acid base, the PKA stuff we were going over, uh, protonated alcohols are pretty strongly acidic. So anything basic in solution is gonna deprotonate this. So uh, the possibilities of what we can deprotonate with is water or iodine. Which do you think will be the one that will be most likely to deprotonate? The water or the iodide ion? Anybody? This is an acid-based discussion of, of the reason why. So once again, the question was, what is more likely to deprotonate with? Water or iodide? Yes, water is more likely to. So you want to think about it, it's basically uh, which one is a stronger base. Water is a stronger base than iodide is. Another way you can think about it too is uh, there, there's also a probability thing going on here too. So uh, if you think about it here, I uh, suppose you have this in solution at a one molar concentration, which is fairly concentrated. So suppose you had this at one molar and it was in water, or you're trying to run the, you were trying to run the reaction in water. Uh, you would have, so if you had one molar of this, that means you have 55 molar of water. So this molecule is more likely to come into contact with water than it is with iodide. And then you also have the additional factor that water is also a stronger base. So water is going to deprotonate. Once again, the reason why is you have a probability thing, which is probably arguably the biggest factor, is this molecule is more likely to run into a water than it is to an iodide just due to the concentration differences. And then additionally, water is a stronger base. So the other product in this particular reaction is hydronium. And then we also have iodide around. Yeah. You may notice on this particular uh, product here, the carbon that has the new OH group is a chiral center. That is a chiral center. So it works out. So here I drew it flat, but I do want to uh, make sure that you guys are understanding this would be a racemic mixture. This final product here would be racemic. And what racemic means is roughly equal R and S. The main reason this even happens, it all has to do with this one right here. So it turns out the main feature for a lot of stuff about SN1 has, to, it all harkens back to this one right here is a lot of the governing principles here. So uh, it works out, if you guys remember, this carbon, car, this, this carbon right here that has the carbocation, it has three electron groups. That makes this sp2 hybridized. So the carbocation is sp2. That means the shape is trigonal planar. The key word is planar. So what you can imagine happening here is imagine my hand here is our flat substrate in the intermediate. And then when the nucleophile comes in, it can come in from the top face or the bottom face. And then each different possibility will lead to an R or an S. So, and because it's flat, there's roughly equal chance it can hit either side. Uh, there, there are some textbooks that go into the details about how you can get slightly more R versus slightly more S. 
I am not worried about it with you guys. So I just want you guys to remember that for CMIC, it's roughly equal RNS on this. Don't worry about if you come across it in your reading or any videos where they're talking about how you, oh, this one gives slightly more R. Don't worry about remember, remembering that. I'm not going to test you on it. Just roughly equal is good enough. All right. Uh, any questions here? Any questions? All right, so uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier uh, today was that, um, well, actually, just this one here, let me pull this one back up. That you have, often you have weak nucleophiles for SN1. Yeah, so the question was back attack versus front attack equals RS, that is exactly right. So it can do a back or front attack because of the fact that the intermediate is planar, it's flat. <clears throat> equal chance it can hit either face, so R and S, where you don't have that with SN2. All right, so uh, I want so I want to go ahead and show you guys one more reaction mechanism. Oh, be jumping the gun here. Oh my gosh, I keep jumping the gun. All right, so it turns out that the rate, remember, is dependent on whatever was involved in the rate determining step. So since the first step was the rate determining step, water was not involved yet. So water is not part of the rate law. The rate law depends 100% on what was in that actual step. So it's just the substrate. So there's your specific rate law. The gen generic one would be just to write the word substrate there. Do not do that. <laughs> All right, so yeah, make sure you're specific on these guys. I want a specific rate law, not a generic one. All right, let's do another one. So I mentioned earlier that oh, yeah, we have weak nucleophiles. Uh, one thing that you're gonna see often in this class is uh, one of the issues between SN1 and SN2, like you guys saw in the handout, that because of the backside attack, SN2 favors primary. Because of the formation of the carbocation, remember the more substituted you are, the more stable your carbocation is. You should have seen that from the video. Sorry, I, I know I didn't mention it here yet, but the more substituted your carbocation is, the more stable it is. So it, uh, things that are tertiary or resonance stabilized tend to favor SN1. The issue comes mainly when it's secondary. When it's secondary, it can go either way, and you start looking for other things. Uh, this one here, I, I'm going to automatically say SN1, and the reason why is because it's, it's secondary and it's an alcohol. The, re the reason why I'm saying that here is because OHs are poor leaving groups on their own. You, you typically need to either use a strong nucleophile to get it to leave, basically a stronger nucleophile than hydroxide is to get it to leave. But can anybody think, so for example, like let's, let's take a look here. What if I did this? So what, suppose I wanted to say trade this out, turn it to an amine group, for example, and I did this. So there is NaNH2. This will not undergo a substitution reaction. And the question is, is why not? This will not undergo SN1 or SN2. Why not? Oh, wait, it's a bad leaving group. Yes. So uh, one of the downsides, so if you were trying to make this thing go SN2, you typically need a strong nucleophile, which is characteristic for SN2 which means that they're typically also a strong base. So if they're a strong base, it's just gonna deprotonate. Like that. All right, so in order for, so if you wanted to get this reaction to actually happen, what you have to do would be to convert this to a better leaving group that was not a acid, acidic compound. So what we can do is, 
there's a new uh, reagent here I want you guys to remember. Phosphorus tribromide, PBR3. So uh, what I'm showing you here, uh, here now is that if you wanted to actually turn this to an amine, how could we do it? So uh, the way we do it is you first convert it to a, bro a bromide by PBR3. Like that. And then if you did NaNH2, this would undergo SN2. So I'm gonna draw the arrows in so we're all clear here. So that did acid base. This one's gonna do the proper backside attack. There's no acidic H's here. And I'm not worrying about stereochem right now, but you would have like inversion and all that jazz happening too. But I'm not worried about that for this part of the discussion. So this one had acidic H's. The issue with this example was the strong nucleophile was also a strong base. Acid base reactions are easier than nucleophile electrophile interactions in general. They happen faster. And then the last part here is uh, this is as no acidic H's. So SN2. This one did acid base. And you guys were hoping acid base chemistry was going away, huh? After last week? Spoil spoiler alert, acid base never goes away. It is permanent part of the class, super important. Never goes away. It's too useful and it, it happens anyway, whether we want it to or not. Yeah, done, done, done. <laughs> All right, so let me show you how you, uh, so typically uh, the way you're gonna see SN, uh, so if your alcohol is secondary, basically if it's not primary, it's typically, uh, if you're gonna do a substitution, oftentimes you're probably gonna, it's gonna be SN1. And these are often acid catalyzed. So uh, if I wanted to turn this to a Cl, for example, I could use HCl. The reason why I'm doing that now uh, using HCl is because right now hydroxide is a poor leaving group. So OH minus is a poor leaving group. Does anyone want to tell me why hydroxide is a poor leaving group? Why do you think hydroxide is a poor, or why would hydroxide be a poor leaving group? It works out thing, uh, things that are strong bases make poor leaving groups. So hydroxide is a poor leaving group because it's a strong base. So, yep, it's basic. Yeah, so to make it a better leaving group, uh, we protonate first. So H, so acid base reaction. We This is all from last week, the acid base stuff we did. We now have a protonated alcohol. Now have a good leaving group. So this is gonna go ahead and leave on its own. Giving us a carbocation. And then what'll happen is your nucleophile finally comes in. So the mechanism is kind of the same. We have the one extra step here that we didn't have in the generic other ones. Like the other ones we had this here. Just not that first part. Oops, let me just draw it down here. And this would be racemic. That is chiral, so that would be racemic. All right, questions so far? Yeah, remember guys, any questions, feel free to ask in the chat. So I wanna write a few things in here too before we go ahead and continue. This step is fast, acid-base reactions are fast. Leaving groups leaving, nucleophiles attacking, they tend to be slower. It works out with this reaction. This is the RDS. 
So even if you do have an acid catalyzed, um, acid, or acid catalyzed SN1, the slow step is always when the leaving group leaves. It doesn't matter if you have this extra part first, this is always the slow step. And then this step is fast also. This one is the slow step. So there's your, uh, from earlier today I was talking about the, the, the fast and slow cars getting off the freeway. That's your slow car. These are the fast cars. All right. Questions, comments, concerns, ETC. All right, um, I'm thinking I actually want to just do one more little thing. And I, I wanted to talk about the energy diagrams for these uh, different reactions. And then I think I'm gonna call it a lecture. And then we'll, uh, we'll do, uh, I think the next time is gonna be basically spending the whole, lec whole lecture time uh, crunching through problems. Uh, basically, we'll, we'll work through the worksheets together. So uh, before tomorrow, before class tomorrow, uh, if you want to make the best out of the class time, have the worksheet uh, done uh, for this week done before tomorrow's lecture, or at least started working on it. If you haven't done so already, I'm highly recommending that to make the most out of tomorrow's lecture. All right, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and reference these generic reactions we had here. So we have the SN1 versus SN2, like this. You know what, I, I, I'll just go ahead and do a specific example for both these since we have more examples to work with. So let's just go ahead and say we have, so we're gonna look at an SN2. So let's go ahead and say it was, I don't know, CH3, Br, I got a yeah interesting story about studying uh, or methyl bromide, pretty nasty stuff. So uh, apparently, from what I understand, uh, this compound methyl bromide used to be a uh, pesticide. Uh, it's currently banned in most countries. It occur uh, as well, you know, including the U.S. This is a banned pesticide, and uh, the reason why is it's a highly toxic to humans. So it, yeah, yeah, it kills the bugs, but it kills the humans too. That's not okay to use. <laughs> so, oh, what ends up happening? What ended up happening? Or, we, or, gosh, it's been about 15 years now. This happened, uh, but apparently, a hotel was fumigating a building for pests. They were basically bombing the building with pesticides. Uh, they thought it was empty, and apparently, there was a family in there still. And yeah, it got them all methyl bromide. They killed a family by basically fumigating a building with this stuff. Very sad. It was not in the U.S. It was overseas, but yeah, pretty gross stuff. Thankfully, we're not working with it in the lab, right? Uh, the product from this would be methanol. And then mass balance typically is whatever the leaving group was. is going to be an anion. And then oftentimes your spectator is going to be with your reagent. That is your spectator sodium. So N-A-B-R. So... Uh, Back in Chemistry 122, you guys probably did these energy diagrams. Actually, let me, um, I think I'm gonna slide my face over to the other side for this part. Oop. Straight my line, whatever. Hang on, that line is bothering me. You know what, I have this pencil pouch with a ruler, I'm gonna use it, oh my goodness, I actually have a need for a ruler today, I'm gonna use it. All right, hang on. All right, so just making a graph here. I'm not used to having to dodge my face when drawing these graphs. <laughs> All right, so there you go, you got that graph. So uh, what goes on on the, on the x-axis is reaction coordinates, also referred to as reaction progress. You should have seen these graphs last semester. during the thermodynamics chapter in chemistry 122. Okay, so uh, here we have our starting point here. So we essentially have, what, CH3Br plus NaOH. Here's our starting point, like that.
Yeah, I know that's a bummer, guys, but it's still technically prerequisite material. I can still pull on it. I can't reteach you a full year of chemistry in this class. So I'm going to say last semester, but yes, I am aware that a lot of you guys, that was a while ago. I'm hoping none of you guys are my classmate in 122. Did anybody have 122 with me? <laughs> that was a couple years ago. Oh yeah, you could have did the other route too. I think like 110, 111 is another route. All right, uh, so it works out. So, uh, you, so I'm gonna do a little bit of review here. See if you guys remember your, one, your 122. So the energy difference between here, so we have this energy barrier we have to push through. You should have covered this in 111 also, or 110 or 111. This, I know this is part of those classes too. What is this range right here? What is that? So here we have an energy barrier it has to push through. What is that energy barrier called? I know they cover this in biology also. Yes, that is activation energy. So that is act, ooh, there should be an I in there. Activation energy. We use a couple symbols for this. So if you, if you, if you took, if you're taking gen chem, you called it EA. And then if you're looking at an organic chemistry textbook, they call it Delta G double dagger. These mean the same thing. Yeah, we'll, uh, uh, I will bring this up again when we go over N, uh, protein. Oh, yeah, this is the enzyme discussion for later. So uh, at the top of the energy peak here, these are transition states. So they're kind of like an in-between between the product and, or between the two steps of the reaction, they're, they're the halfway point. They are theoretical in nature. So these are not isolable, meaning we can't, we can't isolate these guys. They're in-between. Because it is the symbol from V from Vendetta, Am Amber. <laughs> yeah, they use the double dagger symbol for that icon in V from Vendetta. But yeah, this has been a, this, this this symbol has been used in mathematics for a long time. In chemistry, it means transition state. So. It's funny you mentioned that movie because I really think that movie is very prudent to watch in today's times. I'll leave it at that. I recently rewatched it. That's why I remembered it so, so readily. I watched it last week. Yeah, I, I often wonder too if like, they were going for an irony with the like, transition state with that because, I don't know, it could have seemed like they were transitioning to something else. The comic is also a lot darker than the movie is, is as well. So in the movie, they make both V and the Chancellor look like they're villains. Where in the movie, they kind of glamorize V. They show some of the villainous side with like the way that he is with Evie, but in the comics, he is a straight villain. They're both bad. Oh, awesome. All right. So any questions about this? Oh, wait, wait, I have another question for you guys. Yeah, exactly. Society is the villain. Is that what they're trying to say? I don't know. They're both bads. Do uh, you guys remember what this distance is right here? So I'm going to look at this distance. So now we're looking at the distance between the reactants and the products. What do you guys think? What is that? Right here. No, not. Okay. That is the free energy of the reaction. So free energy. 
And we typically call this delta G of the reaction. So the next question I have for you guys, is this a reaction exergonic or endergonic? Once again, the question was, is this reaction exergonic or endergonic? Does it release energy or does it take energy in? Yeah, uh, so if you're showing a case where delta G is negative, meaning it's dropping in energy like that, your delta G is negative, so this would be exergonic example. This, this example is exergonic. And what that means is energy output. It gives off energy. Then you get a net gain in energy. Um, we don't go over it in too much detail in this class. Like we get a little bit of it here, but it, it works out in bi biology. If you actually look at a lot of the reactions in biology, most of them are endergonic meaning that they have to uh, basically take energy input into them. They, they need things like ATP, NADH, energy input into them. And then they're coupled re with reactions that have outputs, like I just said, with like ATP. So, yeah. All right. So I want to take a look at an SN1 example. And this will be like where we wrap up lecture today. So I wanted to do, actually, you know, I'm just going to reference the other examples we did. So we did this, this mechanism earlier. So I just want to draw the graph for it. This is the, the first SN1 mechanism from earlier we are going to reference. So I'm just going to draw over this here. Ah. Yeah, pen and pill. My ruler, slide that up there. So it works out where uh, your graph is gonna have as many bumps as steps in your reaction. So the SN1 was a one step mechanism. So that means you get the one bump in the reaction diagram. This is, these are reaction diagrams I'm doing here. So this is reaction, coordinate, or progress, energy. And then we had a, what that, a two step, Wait, we did a three-step mechanism. So we had one, one, two, three. Yep, three-step mechanism. So if you have a three-step mechanism, it means you have three bumps. Uh, if, I ask, if I were to ask you guys to draw this, what I would be specifically looking for is which one was the highest bump. So when I'm drawing my graph here, we're gonna have three bumps. Which bump should be the highest one? First, second, or third? So once again, the question here, when, draw, when drawing the energy diagram, which is the highest maximum for all the different steps here? Any ideas? Yes, because that's the RDS, right? So yeah, the RDS has the highest activation energy because it's the slowest one. So the speed of the reaction and the rate of the, or sorry, the speed of the reaction is directly related here with the activation energy. You should have learned that in 122, but yeah, I know it's a while ago, whatever. But yeah, the how fast a reaction is, is directly related to activation energy. So the first step is the highest. Boom. We have a transition, we have an intermediate here. So if, you're, if your graph has a minimum in it, that is an intermediate. So one, probably something like that. Yeah, acid-base reactions are actually really low energy. They happen so, so super quick and easy that they're pretty low energy. So I would say that this is roughly what the activation energy or the energy diagram looks like for this diagram. So the main takeaway here is the number of steps equals number of maximums. And you may want to term minima or minim minimums. I learned minimums in math. Uh, these are intermediates. So if we were, if we were filling, the, I, I like to kind of fill in the little pieces here, like what, what compound was where. 
So like there was that, there, that's where our starting compound was. Our carbocation was here. And then like in this step right here was that other intermediate. That was where it had OH2 plus and then pH. And then it was deprotonated to the product. Like that. Uh, we can be a little bit more specific here. Well, I'll, mean, I'll, I'll leave it in there a C plus because that's generic, but I'll be specific here too. Like that. Oops, let me fix that C. All right. So I feel that we're in a really good spot to start doing some practice problems, but that'll be tomorrow. <laughs> So uh, you, you guys uh, really need to, uh, please, uh, I'm, I'm highly recommending that you try to start the worksheets today if you have not done so already. And tomorrow's lecture will be a lot more effective. So please make sure that you guys work on that. So let me go ahead and switch over. Uh, do you guys have any questions about anything? Any questions, comments, concerns, whatever? About anything? So the question I have for you guys, if, uh, while you're asking any questions, are you guys cool with this format? I think it's honestly better, but I want—I I really wanted to try Zoom, and I didn't really enjoy it very much. <laughs> oh, hey, I—I I also want to mention that I am roughly halfway grading the exam, so. I apologize to those of you who have a last name that's late in the alphabet because I believe I'm about halfway. So like the, er, the first half of the class has their exams graded and the other half doesn't. So uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll be getting, before lecture tomorrow for sure, your exam will be graded. So, <laughs> All right. So if you guys don't have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and cut the stream right here. All right, so uh, I will go ahead and hang out in the Discord for a few minutes. You guys you know, always that welcome to ask questions. And I will see you guys tomorrow otherwise. Have a good one, everybody. Stay safe, stay sane. Let me see.